Great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again. Uh, welcome to Houston, Texas, where we are just down the road from uh, Jonathan Space Center. Um, we're happy to be invited to your uh, great club. We're, we're nerdy. Sounds like you guys are pretty nerdy as well. So I think we'll, we'll get along. Um, please ask questions um, as, as we go here. I'm going to kick us off. My name's Brian. I'm an engineer uh, for the space station, and then we've got lots of others here on the team. Uh, this is Craig Stanton. Hey, Sam, who uh, you kind of met. Uh, Tristan. Susan in the back. And there, uh, there's only like 30 more people. Uh, Doug. <laughs> okay, and actually that's it. Awesome. Okay, so we're all here. Uh, this is a project, a volunteer project we've all been working on for many years. Um, we call it ISS Mimic uh, because it's a scale model of the space station and it uses live telemetry streaming from the actual space station to mimic some behaviors in real time. Uh, Sam, take it away. Uh, so if you guys don't mind, we'll uh, play our awesome little YouTube video as kind of an intro to the project. You guys getting sound with the video? Uh, not yet. No sound. Okay. Here, you gotta pause and get out of YouTube. I think it's how you I think it's how you share. Yeah, I think there's something about the sharing way you share it. Zoom setting. Uh, this is YouTube, right? Yeah. So get out of YouTube. Okay. Can you pause it? Yeah, let's pause a second while we try to get the audio figured out. Okay. We'll just, uh, we're going to call Mission Control, see if they can sort it. We're not overly Zoom friendly. Apologize. Really uh, another way we could do this is we could drop the link in the chat if someone else uh, knows how to properly share YouTube for audio. The the best way to share audio is if you stop sharing, reshare, and check the share computer sound when you share your whole screen. There's a little checkbox at the bottom of the share screen. Thank you. We will try that. You've already stopped sharing because it's our camera. Excellent assistance. That was. Hopefully we're just about finished with the technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do click uh, share screen and we may get prompted. Yeah. So the other thing is we're a little limited in what we can do. These are our work machines and they have different settings than a home machine would have in terms of what's available. Yeah, I know that feeling. But we have some. Uh, okay, so now, I'm, now I'm sharing the screen, but now I have to unshare the screen. Okay. We're, it's, so far, it's not prompting us. Okay. We're getting a nice. firewall block. All right. All right. Let's drop All the right. link in the chat, and then can we have a volunteer to share for us? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I didn't think about bringing a personal machine to do this. It's still the work day here. Okay. So we dropped it in there. So someone, uh, please take over. If you wouldn't mind. All right. Hi, dear Sam. Uh, can you please let me know what hardware tools you have used in this system? What hardware we've used? Certainly. Um, yeah, so we're surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, using a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we have uh, the Raspberry Pi 400 keyboard it is uh, what we're using. Um, this one, oh, this one was not. We actually have several that were signed by Liz and uh, Evan Upton. Um, we gave some of those away to teachers. Uh, start. Did we have a volunteer to share? Okay, great. We'll we'll stop messing with it and play. Thank you. Great, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's working.
The International Space Station is kind of a big deal. It's the most complex machine ever made anywhere, and it's in space. But it's so far. Well, it feels far, but it's only 250 miles up. How can we make it feel closer, more tangible, more connected? Well, we could build a model of it. That's fun. Nice job, Lego. But it's kind of just sitting there. The real space station is active. People are there. Things are happening. The real space station moves its solar arrays to track the sun. What if we designed a scale model from scratch using 3D printing, Arduino, and Raspberry Pi? and then put motors in it and made our solar panels turn too. And then what if we use live data streaming from the real space station to turn our arrays to match the real space stations in real time? Well, that's what we did. And we crammed in LEDs and magnets and data screens. Lots of interactive data screens. This is ISS Mimic an articulating scale model replica of the International Space Station that's powered by real data streaming live from the real thing. It's driven by Raspberry Pi and Arduino. By the way, we can make it go fast and crazy. Most people don't get to engage with ISS, even though the world came together to create it. We are NASA engineers who get to work on the ISS as part of our day jobs. Even though we work on it every day, we don't get to see it, touch it. So a few of us got together and decided to make this model. We envision ISS mimics in schools, libraries, museums, airports, and even homes all around the world. Connecting people on Earth with those in space every day. We've been so excited to team up with Space Center Houston and meet with educators from all over the world. The feedback's been great and also gave us a lot of good pointers on other simpler builds we can do. But we need your input to help make this open source project better. Do you want to help? Want to build one? Teachers, we especially want your feedback. We want to help leverage students' excitement about space into interest in STEM and STEAM. The International Space Station belongs to you, to everyone. We created ISS Mimic as a celebration of human spaceflight and to connect space to ground, to you. We hope you'll join us. Okay, feel free to stop the video. Oh so, yeah. That's the uh, our main project video. That's overview, and and this is the model. It's received quite a few upgrades since the uh, the video, but I think we should do our ceremony of going into live mode. So this uh, model is not currently mimicking the ISS, but that is its main purpose. Uh, so what you're seeing right now is exactly what the International Space Station looks like in space in real time right now. So the orientation of all of the solar arrays, the entire outboard truss, and the radiators is currently synced up live with whatever is happening in space. And that's the uh, gist of the project. We do have some uh, slides that go into further detail. Is there, is there any questions at this point? Any thoughts you guys have? Are the LED colors just indicative of the, the sync status, or do they show other information? Great question. No, actually, they're showing the battery status. So right now, if I don't, don't do that, I'm not allowed <laughs> to push the screen button yet. All right, so uh, the batteries the batteries are in discharge state. We are over a nighttime pass at the moment, so the station is in dark. It's not getting solar power as we speak, and so the lights, uh, we're, about, we're pulling current off the batteries right now. So when they go, when they change colors to white or blue, they're charging or fully, fully start, uh, fully charged. 
So we, we found it was, you, know, you can look at numbers on a screen all day long, but you don't necessarily know what the numbers are meaning, right? So in this case, color status is much easier to understand. So, um, fun to watch as it turns into. And, and pretty fun to watch as it, as, it, as it goes into a daylight or comes out of the daylight period. Um, we've had uh, interesting things when we first turned it on, got it working. One of our things was one of the lights on one of the LED boards was a different color. And we went, why is that? And it turned out that they were having a power trouble on that particular channel. So it wasn't that it was a bad circuit or something on our side. It really was that was what the data was showing us. So really easy to see it when it's a color indicator light instead of uh, just a number on the screen. Is that up? Yeah, so as it moves to the orbit, you'll see the, the LEDs change from red to blue to white. Blue means they're in the sunlight and charging, and white means they're fully charged and ready for the night pass. So how, how de detailed is the telemetry? Uh, if you go to our website, issmimic.space, which then leads to our GitHub, you can see all of the public telemetry. There are 300 and something telemetry items uh, that cover all of the rotational angles of the solar rays, solar ray voltages. We've got the robotic arm data for the Canada arm. Uh, we've got some visiting vehicle data for the Russian segment. We've got um, environmental life support system data. Uh, we've got urine tank data, which has recently gone quite viral, but uh, yeah. All the tools in the Yeah, and we've got uh, this, our Raspberry Pi thing, which Hold on to that because you'll pull that out. Okay. Um, so our Raspberry Pi screen here is driven uh, by the telemetry, and we've got data for all of the ISS subsystems, which is currently in work. Uh, right now, the red text indicates that we're in a loss of signal, but this is some of the control moment gyroscopes on the space station, which uh, use angular momentum to steer the ISS. So we've got a ton of data on that. Okay. Of course, the electrical power system, so we can see what status all of the solar rays are in. Uh, we can see the EVA screen. Uh, if there's a spacewalk happening, we can see what the airlock pressure is. <laughs> this is very hard to, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So you, have, you have like the full telemetry on, on the digitally, and then some of the stuff gets reflected in the mimic itself. That's really cool. Right, right. So, so the actual 3D printed model itself, obviously, uh, we can't, you know, utilize all of the data to drive something, but we try to have as many data screens on the Pi as we can. And the the Raspberry Pi runs completely independent of the model. So, if you have a Raspberry Pi, you can just install our software to view the telemetry whenever you want. I have one running all the time, constantly. Oh, nice. Uh, Sam, do you mind walking us through the data to the pies? I mean, sorry, to the Arduinos and all that, and how the data gets flown? Sure. So, uh, of course, our Raspberry Pi in the keyboard here. Um, but from the International Space Station, if we can go up to the antennas, these antennas here, I'm lying, but these antennas here <laughs> send data back to the ground. And you <clears> might <throat> tell that they're pointed away from the ground, because all of the data from the International Space Station actually goes further into space first. It goes to a constellation of uh, geostationary satellites called TDRS, Tracking and Data Relay System. And then from the TDRS satellites, they send them to uh, a ground station like in Guam or White Sands, New Mexico, which then sends the data to the Johnson Space Center, which then sends the data to an uh, Italian company, which then sends the data to the rest of the world, which you know is picked up by our lovely Raspberry Pi. And from the Raspberry Pi, we send it out to four Arduino-type microcontrollers which do all of the uh, processing of the motor commands, and they send them all of the instructions to the actual motors to turn the model to match the orientation. So it is quite a convoluted data path to get here. We estimate that we're about 30 seconds delayed from actual space station movements, but pretty good considering the uh, distance the data has to travel. Wow. And how fragile is that model? Like when you guys take it somewhere for a, a show or something like that, I guess you'd be very careful it's with the packing and unpacking, is it? Right. Uh, we've, we've been traveling a lot with it recently. We've taken it to San Francisco and Seattle. And uh, so far, nothing has broken too much. Um, the model itself is surprisingly not fragile, except for a few key uh, delicate features like the solar rays and the outboard truss. 
Thank you. And we do ha currently have on our GitHub, uh, we've got a uh, high fidelity model, which is this one, which has you know way more detail, but it's not quite as uh, structurally rigid as our low fidelity model, which you know doesn't sacrifices detail for strength and uh, ease of printing. Right, and electric electric grid holds together well. You haven't had fires or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> generally no. We, we've had we've had one fire, and we think that's solved. Um, <laughs> it was a small fire. Our our motor driver boards. One of them uh, caught flame once and quickly extinguished, but. Uh, to be completely honest, we're not 100% sure what caused that, but it hasn't happened again, so we think it's solved. Yeah, but as sure. you can tell, this, is, this is a maker project, right? So we're constantly making and getting better. So, Right. So how long did it take you to make the model? It must have been quite a while to design it all and uh, print it and assemble so, it. So I think we're on something like eight years now. Yeah. Uh, but re realistically, it wasn't. You know, this has been a volunteer project by a bunch of us, so it hasn't been too many of us, too many hours along that path. We, you know, nights, weekends, eight, occasionally. Eight years have, since the project started. Yeah. It does not take eight years to actually build one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no um, we, we can probably build one in, in maybe a month. Well, the library, so. we did a, a group project with the library. Can you come to the mic? Yeah. We did a group project with the library. The library. <laughs> a library, our local library, and it was like two months. Three and months they came and every couple every weeks. other week, spent two hours, and they built one. So mm. to build one right now wouldn't take that long. But then you see we make a better model of something, and then you want to go change it, and we're always improving. And you can use oh, oh well, I just heard, um, pretty pretty on the chat is, uh, when when the Nauka was incorporated in ISS, did our model simulate it going out of control? Uh, <laughs> we picked it up and turned around. No, no, we didn't. Yeah. no unfortunately not. We, I, I think we would have noticed, however, that if I go back to the other screen here, let's see, go back one more. The uh, where's the C? Can you rotate down? Oh, you got it. Okay. Oh, the uh, yeah, 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 that's it. I'm looking for the right button. So the, this CMGs gave up instantly. Uh, and so we would have seen the day of flatline <laughs> and we gotten a chance to uh, pay attention to that during the moment. Yeah, the interesting thing about this screen is this this graph in the middle, which shows uh, the CMG saturation state. So electrically, they try to drive these uh, gimbals to turn the ISS as much as possible without using actual, you know, thruster fuel, because that's obviously a consumable item and we have power for days. Um, but these can only do so much before they have to be desaturated. And so on the day when the, the, the MLM, the Nauka event happens, yeah, obviously the CMGs were not up to the task of, uh, <laughs> yeah, fully, fully controlling that. Oh, very interesting. Is there a 3D model available for the ISS? That's a great question. Yes, there is. Um, this model, every single model, every single part of the code, every file that we've used to create this project is available on our GitHub online for free. It's completely open source. Um, we even have a link to the source model that we started the project from, um, which was a NASA 3D model uh, that is, you know, it's great for visualizing, but it's not, you can't just print it out of the box. So most of the work has been um, actually, you know, taking that model and throwing it into uh, CAD software and modeling it, and making it actually, you know, printable. But every time we, we finish those and we test them, we put them on GitHub. So all of our models and even the raw CAD model for the entire assembly is available. It's not hosted on GitHub, but if you uh, feel free to join our Discord. And if, if you ask me for the full ISS model, I can I can give it to you. So uh, just so like all the files that you need to print are on GitHub, but if you wanted the, the it's Fusion, right? Fusion 360, the source, the our model, then yeah, that would be get there yeah that's not on github just because it's a ginormous file but uh, oh. very impressive and the 3d printer you need to use is it just not a special one it's just like a standard one that people would have at home so everything will print on a prusa mini uh so a little tiny build plate uh the solar arrays in this state we do have a two-piece printable one that'll fit two pieces on the build plate so you can use a fairly small uh size Build plate to print the whole thing. 
obviously you need a bigger printer for the full on single piece solar arrays. But, uh, the, every single item on here can be printed on a standard 3D printer with regular PLA, except for our fancy solar arrays. But we do have the ones that can be printed on a standard printer. So yeah, nothing fancy required. So yeah, so uh, Susan mentioned earlier the, the library build and uh, Sam maybe can bring up some terms about that in just a minute. But yeah, that's one thing we wanted to do there was try out some others. So we have some that are kind of two part, like they mentioned, and it's also, it has a little less detail in the truss area, which is the weaker, the weakest part. Um, so we really beefed that up and um, yeah, the two part worked really well. So what we, what we use for these, um, these here, uh, Sam painstakingly painted but um, the, the other version is just vinyl stickers that go on, so there's no painting required. And those vinyl stickers you cut on like a cricket, and those are enough to basically hold the two halves together. And the, uh, the model scale is uh, 1% or 1 to 100. Okay, Craig's got a two-parter example here. Yeah, it prints pretty well. Right. If I get a little bit closer, you can see that there's the truss the, mm -hmm. it's not it, it's solid it just looks detailed edged on but it's not uh, that a little floppy the cricket the cricket stickers and do work really well to we just it. had a large uh, jump on the space station solar rays that was not that was mostly because we just came out of what's known as the zone of exclusion uh, so we had like a 15 minute period where we were not receiving data from the iss but now now we are back live cool Oh, it's not working right now. Ah, <laughs> right, so that's why it's not working. Okay. <laughs> so your, Discord seems, your Discord channel seems quite um, quite active. It seems like there's quite a big community behind it. Is that right? Or is that just you guys being very enthusiastic? Uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, recently, a few weeks ago, the YouTube channel 3D Printing Nerd released a, a video on our project. And that drove a lot of uh, our Discord traffic. But yeah, um, that between that and this... Um, uh, Hackster IO video and yeah, our Discord community has grown to over 200 people now, which is pretty good. Yeah, good. most most of that's in the last couple months, I would say, right? Yeah, yeah. Discord channel also lets you know when there are major events happening. Like I'm telling you, the MT is translating now. What's the MT? A uh, mobile transporter. What's that? That's a little cart that goes <laughs> along the front of the truss. Uh -huh. It was critical in assembling the station because you had to reach out and. Do things. Yeah. Was there a question? Oh, it was a facetious comment. I was wondering where it was on the model. Um, well, it's going to be there eventually. Yeah. So, what, once you join the project and add it, then it'll be on there. It will be there. So, so we have an arm, and honestly, I don't see it, but we do have a model of the MT system, but right now it's not attached to the model. We would have to just kind of glue it in place. Uh, but we do want to make one that will actually traverse back and forth on there using the telemetry data. So uh, we can do that. We're probably not going to get the arm working because those those are just too small. Um, but we do, have, we do have a display that shows the MT moving while it's moving. Uh, yeah, are you is, just uh, uh, using RC? Yeah. So that will show where the MT is right now. Up, up a little bit. Yeah. 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 That's not that's not so it's that one. This is the one that shows it. I got to scale it and uh, go up to the other one. But okay. it will show it moving down the. So that shows right now that the MT is over on the S3 side, uh, which is back over here. And the uh, question about what about docking sequences? Um, we do have docking data for the Russian segment, so we do have all of these mo uh, modules are attached with magnets, so we try to keep it up to date as possible. Because um, we can tell for the Russian segment what vehicles are present. And then for the US side, for some reason, the docking data is not available in the public stream yet. I do plan to request more data added, get added to the public stream. Um, but we can kind of infer when there's a US vehicle attached. Uh, there's the ISS station mode will change to proximity operations mode. And then, yeah, we can do some web scraping to tell if there's a, a vehicle launch. So we can we can do some tricks to tell if there's docking. Are you just using RC servos for the movement? No, we would like to be. 
Um, in fact, I've been talking to a servo manufacturer for that. I was trying to find our little motor to show you. Uh, they're gear DC motors. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, awkwardly bring the camera up again. Yeah, we used to keep one out on the table. Um, so let's see. You can kind of see. Oh, they're, they're digging for one. While they're, while they're trying to find that, I'll show you another item. You mind holding this? Yeah. Uh, another item. So this is, um, so let's point back over here again. So just like the real space station, uh, I can't see where we are, Sam. Okay, now we'll jump back. <laughs> Hard segue. Uh, you can come back to me. All right, yes, about the motor. So we do love these little gear DC motors. So it's got a, a magnet on the back, uh, dual channel Hall effect for quadrature encoding. Um, and I think it's 150 to one gear reduction. And so we love these. These are in uh, 10 of our 12 motors. Um, so for instance, one would go right here, kind of see where, where that is, it'll pop up all out. Um, and then, so we have those, those control each of the, you know, uh, beta gimbal assemblies, which is what we call the, that, that rotational axis. Also, there's another one in here. I don't, you're not gonna be able to see it, but there's a 3D printed gear. This white thing is a 3D printed gear. And there's another of these motors with a pinion, uh, that turns that. But just as I was saying earlier, just like the real space station, this whole this whole this segment is the outboard truss. As it rotates, um, power and data pass across that joint. But of course, if it was if it was just wires, those wires would you know get all twisted up. So the real space station, just like ours, uh, has a slip ring that goes in here. So that's what this piece is. And let me I'll try to be still so it's easy for you. So this can rotate continuously uh, without getting bound up because um, it has copper rings in there that um, transfer the power of data. I didn't address this, but the question, how do you set the positions for accurate position? Ah, uh, so yes. So that's one thing, one reason I wish we had RC servos. The reason we don't is because it's hard to find a compact um, servo that can do continuous rotation with feedback. Um, there's some that'll do continuous rotation. Uh, there's some that will um, give you kind of coarse analog feedback, but there's a discontinuity as it turns over. So in, Sorry, there's some stage, stage directions happening. Um, so what we do instead is we have to zero these, right? These, these are great. It's much more fidelity than we need. It's like a fraction of a degree for each blip of the Hall effect, uh, but we have to calibrate every time. So there's other rope, there's other motors. Um, there's some that are like, just kind of like a regular sized servo motor, for instance, that are awesome. They have lots of uh, robotists. They have the Dynamixel. I was talking with them about um, trying to, uh, get a, a smaller version of, of their motors because, uh, yeah, there's a lot of advantages there if you went to like a regular DC motor. Actually, Susan, yeah, if you want to hand me that now. So for the for the, the least interesting part of, of what moves um, is, uh, are these radiators at the back? I don't know if you're gonna be able to get a view of those. Uh, the HRS radiators, uh, heat rejection system. So uh, there's ammonia being pumped through these and that's what takes the heat out of the space station so it doesn't doesn't cook inside. Um, so these do use a regular hobby servo. Uh, so this is just a micro scale servo. And we can do that because it only rotates like plus or minus 100 degrees. Um, if only they were also simple. And I say it's the least interesting just because they never move, right? The one that's the easiest to move, they just don't need it. Uh, they, their system's just too efficient. They don't have to point it away from the sun somewhere. And a uh, question, what about crew data? Yeah, take that one. Which hopefully nobody here knows what the actual crew is, so I can just lie and say that the screen is live. Um, but but we do get we do have ways of finding out who the current crew is on board. Uh, it's not live now, but that's uh, it will be soon. Yeah, we're in the process of changing, so you'll be able to see who's currently on board and how long the ISS has been continuously crewed. Um, then we also have data on the ECLIS system which uh, you know, shows the environmental life support systems on the ISS and, and yeah, yeah, hopefully we can get more crew data soon, but we used to rely on a website called how many people are in space and then they stopped uh, maintaining that, but yeah. Yeah, every time we code something, something changes and then so we're trying to figure out a better way. Uh, so before we run out of time, uh, I just definitely keep the questions coming, but I wanted to highlight one thing and uh, it was mentioned in the video, but we started partnering with, with educators. I don't know if we'll have time to show some photos of, uh, of when we've done the, the library bills Susan mentioned. Uh, also this summer, we did a teacher workshop. By, by we, I really mean uh, an educator 
that's uh, very interested in the project and is taking now taking the lead role. But one thing we've often gotten back from educators is they really like this. They think it's cool, but it's just so much to take on. The size, the complexity, the detail, and the materials cost are all you know hindrances. So they've asked for something that kind of captures the essence of it, but is you know scaled down in kind of every sense of the word. Um, so what we've come up with is something called what we call mini or mini mimic. Um, that's this guy. So this is half the scale of, uh, of the, the one percenter, so like 0.5. And of course, you're scaling down in three dimensions, so it's kind of like, you know, an eighth, an eighth is big. Um, but we still have the solar arrays. Uh, we have, you know, much smaller. I don't know that I dare. So some these are these are these don't come off this way. We're still working out some of it. This is new this summer. This back to the RC servos question. And in, in this case, we did go with RC servos, and I die inside a little a little bit every time I think about it. That these can't can't really mimic the full rotation of the real space station. These do go 300 degrees, so it's it's most of it. Um, same with the outboard truss. We don't have that slip ring feature here, so we just have to be careful how we're going. And in fact, we're still kind of tweaking the commands to get. A lot of a lot of movement without it being too nuts, but this was really cool. Um, we had some educators from from Mexico and, and other uh, other locations this summer that learned to do this and are now deploying them in their classrooms uh, right now. I've got we got some photos back, so that's really satisfying. And that's you know the, the purpose. It's on your desk. What, what's that? If it's on your if it's desk. on your desk. Yeah, we'll eventually all have one. Of these. <laughs> we'll all have one. <laughs> uh, what's really cool, which Sam pointed out before, I think, is so this is also running on a Raspberry Pi, and it's the exact same software. In fact, we've, we've run both, both models off of a single Raspberry Pi before. So all of that is the same. All that's the same. You just plug in whatever you want. Uh, Sam and my, I made a decision early on that everybody gets all the data. So it's just a pipe of data coming out over USB, and then you choose to do what you want with it. Um, we're not sending, I guess we're not sending all the data. We're using the, the data set that we use for anything. But no problem to just add more. And we also want people to come up with their own own uses for this right it's like yeah you can you can maybe use the pie as is with the image or whatever as yeah, is and yeah, now you have yeah, questions you're piping your own okay stopping the monologue for questions uh, uh so so when the iss why does this scroll with the message <laughs> when the iss orbit is boosted is the data available yes um the data is available and if you join our discord server <laughs> and subscribe to the iss telemetry channel you will get all of that data and so i love seeing when the reboost happens uh, and do you ever think you'll bring this to the UK? We would love to. <laughs> Somebody buy us a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have, for whatever reason, the Raspberry Pi Foundation really loves us. So um, we'll see. We'll see. We're going to see them at Bay Area uh, Maker Fair. Uh, what are the screens you're using on the Pi's? Oh, well, what are the actual screens? Uh, well, this, this screen is the uh, official Raspberry Pi touchscreen in the, um, I forgot who makes the case, but it's a good case. And then. Smart something? Yeah, smart pie case or something, and then what is the, this one? Yeah, this one is just uh, kind of a normal like add-on for your tablet when you want to see it at the back. So this, or for your, sorry, for your uh, laptop, it's like an extra monitor thing. This is just over HDMI, but it is touchscreen. So we like this because it's you know bigger scale. This, uh, the smaller one that we just showed, the seven inch has been our standard, but this is just kind of showing two different ways to do it. Or you can just use a regular monitor and use a mouse instead of a touchscreen. Uh, could you simulate the view from a window on the station? Yes, that would be cool. Um, that's a stretch goal. <laughs> so what we and I think what we haven't done is uh, do a fast playback. Oh yeah. Because if you notice, the station hasn't moved a ton while we've been talking, because it moves very slowly just to track the sun. But we can also play back the data at whatever speed we want. Considered using Bowden cables for the movement. So like to push wires or something, mm -hmm. mountain cables, like for all the motors brain. in a separate box with the yeah. cables uh, transferring the force. So the challenge there again would certainly be like across across something that's continuously rotating. I don't I don't really see how that would work. Uh, that'd be cool for the arm, yeah. The arm. Oh, for the arm, yeah, yeah. It might, it might have, still be tricky yeah. just because there's a number of ways you can run into singularities in the in the arm movement. Basically, joint angle combinations where um, the arm could get itself stuck depending on how you have the motors or yeah. how the actuator is arranged. You may have trouble getting out of there. But if you have more ideas, share them. And apparently, this this presentation today is really an advertisement for our Discord. Roll. So <laughs> join our Discord and then post the question. And, and feel free to solve one of the problems and uh, come up with a solution for us. Yeah, that would be great. One of the one of the difficulties in phys physically actuating models, especially with the, the arm, 
is that the real robot arm is not meant to hold itself up in one G, right? It's only meant to work in zero G. And so that affects how everything on that is sized. And so if we just do a straight scale model of that, we're going to run into all kinds of problems just trying to hold it up that the real one isn't going to have to deal with. Uh, how is the data fed to the Pi? Uh, the Pi is the initial source of the data. So the Pi just connects the data over regular internet. Then the Pi sends the data to the Arduinos over micro USB cables. And then the Arduino send the data to the motors over, we use uh, HDMI cables, just as dumb 20 pin conductor cables. If you may want to drop a link to the page you guys created on GitHub, that you host on GitHub, that it shows all the data. Or good idea. <laughs> so Sam and Tristan put together, uh, I guess it was Tristan actually, <laughs> maybe I'll have put together, um, Sam's going to drop the link, but this is just a way to see all the data. Uh, it's tying into the same light, uh, light streamer page to get all the data, but it's a cool way to see lots of text and lots of numbers changing. So when you guys, started, when you guys started your team, did you have all these skills already, or did you have to build a lot of the skills as you're building it? <laughs> we, <laughs> so there were, there were various pieces and various sets of uh, array or disarray when we started. So um, I do a lot of CAD design myself, and so... Um, the, the design work was was kind of there. We started out with some publicly available NASA models that were the super low fidelity ones, uh, that PDF file. So, I, I mean, I did some of that in really, really old AutoCAD way back in the day. Uh, but to design work, we had design skills. Uh, as far as software, none of us on the team are actually software programmers. So Sam is taking it out himself. Well, okay, Tristan's got oh, some, Tristan some bad skills, that's for sure. But... Generally, none of us are in the software side of the industry. And so, um, you know, Sam and Tristan have taken off a huge amount of learning Pi and Kibbe and, uh, you know, so, Arduino ID. And yeah, Susan's if, done a lot of work with graphics and Kibbe. And, if you are a software engineer and you look through our GitHub, I apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, clean up the code. That's great. I think we recently had ChatGPT so, solve some of the issues for us. So that was useful. Um, but yeah, we're always as we're trying to add more data and more things, you know, it becomes more and more. And that, that's also what's really neat about this project because it is open source. If you have a better way to do something and you say, hey, why are you doing it that way? Do it this way. You can suggest it and that may become part of the master code. Yeah, we're, we're not experts by any stretch. So anything, uh, anything you could suggest would be useful. Yeah, we did have a, a contributor a while back. Uh, completely revamp our code that pulls in the telemetry data. So the, the way we pull in the telemetry data, basically because it can come in at any time, um, is we actually have a separate process um, running that just pulls in the data and it stores it in uh, just an SQLite database so that we are never having to worry about trying to read and write at the same time and getting invalid data out of it. Uh, initially, that was written in Java. The part that pulls in the data was written in JavaScript because at the time that was the only uh, client that Livestreamer made available for free. Um, and then the rest of the code was in Python that then reads from that uh, database to send everything out to the displays in the model. Uh, we had a contributor recently redo all that JavaScript and replace it with Python, so everything is in Python now. I say the, the best thing about the a team is whether everyone has enthusiasm for the project. It seems like you guys certainly do. It, it, admittedly, a majority of us work on the space station program. Um, and so it's, it, it's, yeah, we're pretty passionate about it. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair way to say it. Um, I, I know personally, I, I've worked on the program for uh, a good 25 plus years now. And so I, I've, crawled all over the vehicle before we launched it just to make sure when we got it in orbit, we can put it together. Um, and so to me, this is a project that says now I can share that and those stories with the rest of the world. So that's, that's a way that, you know, just kind of put that back into the system and say, it's not just a thing we did in some clean room somewhere. It's really a thing that's alive, breathing, constantly changing and, uh, you know, has a life of its own. No, let's see disco mode. Disco mode? Disco mode. They've earned disco mode. <laughs> oh. We're not, not going to fling the arrays off, are we? <laughs> we'll find out. Well, we, well, we did well, the we other did last day, time. so we'll see. <laughs>
That'll be a bonus. We have a we have a special dancing mode for the ISS that we spring out on special occasions. <laughs> the real ISS does not do this. And this is not a two way data transmit, so it's not making the station. Do <laughs> stuff. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's the fun part of having all the motors and lights is you can make them do whatever you want to as well as what they're supposed to do or what they're intended to do. Yeah. So, we so do, we do all the Go ahead. Sorry, I think I saw in one of your videos that um, you've taken this to the um, uh, to the office or to the control center so they could see what the actual state of the ISS was. Does it, that was helpful somehow? Yeah, so we've taken it in the mission control in the, in the uh, mission execution rooms, the back rooms. That were all the you know the support engineers there from the flight control rooms, and so uh, that uh, we took it in there for some of these EVAs uh, and some of the activities. Spacewalks, yeah, spacewalk. So, as a matter of fact, the first uh, all women EVA we had mimic in the control room when that was happening. It was really kind of a cool thing for us just to be able to, to share that and have that whole thing. Uh, and it lived about a, I think about a month. Yeah. in the mission control, it was really kind of neat to just have it there and. It was meant to be a one-day visit, and then they saw it and were like, no, we want to keep it. And we had a couple of anomalies. <laughs> we had, it was still early. It was still in the prototyping phase, and so we had a couple of weird things happen to it while we were there. But, yeah, it's interesting, too, and it, we've, we've taken it out to some live events, uh, public events sort of things, and then, you know, it turns out that one set of arrays is, you know, almost not existent uh, or not moving and the other ones are just doing their thing. And people are like, oh, your model's broken. And we're looking at it going, no, the, the data, that's doing what the data is saying. So we'd have to reach back into some of our cohorts and go, hey, what is going on? Uh, and that particular event that was back in March of this year, they had, if you remember, there was a Soyuz had a thermal uh, leak, thermal system leak. I don't know the arrays on this one, but you know, it, was a, it was a leak in some of, the, some of the coolant systems on the Soyuz module. And so what ended up happening was they were using the arrays to shadow the Soyuz just so that it would, would stay cooler. So in that case, we were watching that the, the arrays were only moving a little bit, and that was just because they were trying to keep the arrays over in over the block part of, this, part of the vehicle. Wow. Uh, as a matter of fact, even lately, they've been having some trouble with one of the, uh, with the rotary joints. And so there's been a lot of directed position where they, they try not to move it. They, they rotate it into a larger degree chunk just to be able to uh, position it right, just to put less wear and tear on the motor while they figure out what to do with it. So that that's you'll see that in the Discord channel lately. We call it a directed position to the Sarge. Uh, that, that's, that's an ongoing thing right now. Because, uh, yeah, so what's the – he's mentioned in the status updates in the Discord. So what are – did you – Reference those already? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have a channel on our Discord called ISS Telemetry, which pushes interesting telemetry events to whoever wants to know. Just updates the channel with that info, right? Yeah, so whenever that pops out, and when we get that string in a telemetry chunk, it just feeds the. Discord. And like if it tells you MT is, is about this movie now, there's a little, there's a pause there. There's a pause of several minutes because they unlock it and then they wait before they actually move. So I'll tell you it's moving and you go to the display. Might not be moving yet, but it will. Cool. And then don't go back and do your work because you'll miss it. <laughs> Speaking from experience. <laughs> oh, they're already there. It's not, it's not okay. real fast, but it doesn't really have that far to go. So yeah. to go from work site to work site only takes a few minutes. So um, there's only, uh, what, six places on the trust it actually goes to. So, yeah, it's a, you know, there's oh, not yeah, far there's, to go. There's eight. Is there eight more? So I, I think we're um, I think we're past our time. So feel free to give us the boot whenever uh, whenever we need to go. Or we'll ask questions if you got more questions, questions coming. So. I've got a last question. question. The as the ISS orbits, does it stay in that um, orientation um, relative to the Earth? So is down always down? It's a good question. No is the answer. Um, typically is the answer. Typically, <laughs> typically yes. Uh, barring a major event where the thing is flipping or doing uh, No, there's a lot of times when they actually will flip, will rotate the station around to do Soyuz dockings, or there, there, there is some attitude adjustment that does happen. We, it's we it's have, rare for down to not be down. here, though. Yeah. Okay. You know. Thank you. At least now. The window, the cupola windows are down. The crew like to look at the Earth, so we like to have them be able to look at the Earth. 
uh, but we do spin the vehicle around and fly it backwards sometimes, and then there's some occasionally blue tips. So one thing uh, on that, one thing, since Earth is usually below, one thing we used to do, we have a, we have a, a TV actually under here, flat, and so it just be a, uh, sometimes we do the live stream of Earth, um, and then in the course of going to various events, we broke two TVs, so, <laughs> so we don't do that anymore. And instead, we uh, we do have a projector, and we'll like project Earth behind it, which is not oriented correctly, but it's still it's still. So one of the things we've talked about doing, we haven't we haven't done this yet, but you know the, the Z1 truss with this uh, Z, CMGs on the back that Sam talked about earlier. Uh, we have talked about even making a uh, what we call an attitude indicator where it would literally gimbal over based on the CMG positional data and then you would have a clue as to which direction it's facing at any particular time. That would be a little bit bigger than that size model just because we can't really get something that would do it uh, with the motors and things of that scale. But that would be something because we, 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 we originally talked about making an entire gimbal set for the whole model just to rotate the whole model, but that got to be uh, a bit more and, and, you know, Bit bigger than we wanted to manage or try to move around, so uh, we thought maybe something smaller, desktop size, like the mini mimic, would be useful. Yeah, we've when also you, talked. About, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, when you rotate the panels um, on the real thing, how do you deal with the reaction torque, reaction moment? It's a pretty slow move. It's a pretty slow motion. Yeah, you still have to. You still. It's the CMGs is the answer. You still have to react it or it would. Yep, CMGs. Uh, take that, take that out. Good question. Why, since the panels um, can rotate three hundred and sixty degrees, you don't um, rotate them in opposite directions to cancel. Well, so primarily the point is for power generation, right? So normally you might do that. It would still introduce a. I think you'd start spinning on a different axis if you did that, just because they're not co-located, right? Um, but. Uh, you know, it's, it's mostly for power that we have them there. So, uh, yeah, that answered your question. Yeah. It, that kind of wins over momentum management. Plus, there's a whole team for momentum management. They need something to do. Keeps our GNC people busy. A lot. They're busy all the time, yeah. yeah. Nice. Any more questions? One last question, anyone? That was, that was fabulous. Well, great. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always fun to talk to people and, and you know, again, share what we're doing. So, yeah. Sorry, I, I did have one question. How, how many of these have been built? Do you know? Do you know how many people have actually built one of these? Oh, wow. I've built a lot of these species that we're going to do. They did it, they executed it, and they executed it. Okay. That's what I'm So, we built three. Uh, two, we have this one, we have the other one in another room, and we have one at the local library. We know that there's several others being built, and we know we have several more. Before. So there's three that we know of in existence, at least one or two more others that people are out building themselves, and then uh, we have more to go build. And then the, the mini miniatures, uh, I think there's five or six. six of those in the wild and more coming soon. I know we're really short on time. Do you have the charts up just for a quick flip through from the library or, or do you not have uh, Yeah. Okay, we're just gonna real quickly show, um, Susan mentioned this past fall and into January, we did a, a build at the local library. And I just love, I just love this because, you know, it's, it's people of all ages. The parents came thinking just their kids were gonna do the work and then we made the parents do the work too. Um, so they're learning, you know, Arduino and Raspberry Pi basics. It was more than just building building the model, you know, they're learning, they're doing a little bit of coding on, you know, like a Hello World or a, you know, flash LED with a Pi and Arduino. And then they are, they are doing the physical assembly. Um, yeah, they, they, we actually had some great people, great kids that could solder. One did a science fair project on solder. Um, they were doing, uh, yeah, so this was awesome as a collaborative build. Um, certainly the fastest we've ever made a mimic. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, we had educator partners and, the library and uh so anyway it was a it was a lot of fun a lot of different skills coming together and yeah good times all right i think we can close with that cool thanks very much thank you that was awesome thank you very good thank you so much thanks guys thanks to the whole team bye
Take care. We'll see you soon. We have Take to care. wait longer to go get our pint. <laughs> Still working. A pint of coffee. <laughs> right. <laughs>